Buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a comenzar este tiempo. Eh, mi nombre es Yolanda Villarreal Jalés y trabajo con la parte del Centro para la Justicia Global. En lo particular me da mucho gusto ver tanta audiencia y tanto interés por este tema. Y mi labor va a ser eh, estar mediadora con mis compañeros con cada tema, con el tema de cada uno de ellos. Eh, todos sabemos, todos los presentadores, los que van a presentar saben que, que aproximadamente son 15, 20 minutos. Eh, vamos a tratar de hacer lo más ágil y entendible para la traducción. Y voy a empezar con, con Lili. Ella es una artista plástica de Colorado. Eh, ella es una mujer muy activa, por lo que veo, lo que me han comentado de ella. Ella eh, participa eh, en diversos colegios, en diversos grupos. Uno de ellos me parece muy interesante, que se llama Art No Wants, Wants, que más o menos se traduce traduciría como artemantas y esto es el nombre del mundo Can't you just change it yourself? Todos pueden escuchar la, la traducción en español al inglés. Bueno, continúo con la presentación de Lili, que es una artista plástica de Colorado. Eh, ella pertenece a un colectivo interesante que es Art Alemán, se puede traducirse como Artenautas y esto es a nivel mundial. También participa en el otro movimiento, en el Bienal Directo, en el Haití. Y el arte, entiendo que es muy importante para ella, ella tiene aquí una exhibición también, es parte de los artistas colectivos. Y pues le doy el micrófono, el micrófono a ella para que pueda hablarnos sobre el el tema que es sistemas alimenticios para la humanidad, que es algo importante también para él. Sí, sí, sí. 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 I focus on the food justice movement and I'll talk about how I incorporate the ideas into my artistic practice to carry them out into the world. Terramate is a conference that takes place every other October in Turin, Italy, the birth of the slow food movement. Over a hundred countries send representatives. So it's a very wide range of people bringing their food traditions and their concerns as they face the globalization of the industrial agriculture. I feel like it is the most important to dialogue around maintaining food traditions that we have today. I went two years ago as a delegate for a Slow Food U.S. And it was at that time that I had a really interesting conversation with the Pacific fisherman, Jerry Brown. My brother's a mariner, and mariners have this very clear, steady gaze and deep understanding. 
understanding of the world, perhaps because we spend so much time on the sea. And we talked about the great Pacific garbage patch, which he sailed through many times. And he was so excited to say, finally, someone has brought up the impact of agriculture on the ocean. Which I think is important because it's what literally connects us globally, the oceans. We talked about how many misconceptions there are. That many people think that the garbage patch is a floating island of trash and the size of Texas. He talked about waiting for debris from Japan after a tsunami. And when it arrived on the northwest shores, all these photojournalists went out to, to photograph it, and they chose the biggest thing that they could find, which was this big piece of dock, and took all these you know, sensational images and released them. And he says that's not the problem. In fact, big pieces are important parts of ocean ecosystems. Things grow on them. They support colonies for baby sea life. The reality is terrifying. These swaths are confetti-sized pieces of plastic because plastic photodegrades but never cycles into the environment. They are completely integrated with plankton, which is the foundation of the ocean ecosystems. It captures between a third and half of our carbon and produces that much oxygen. We can't pick up the plastic without picking up the plankton. The little fish that eat the plankton are consuming the plastic. It affects their internal systems, blockages. But the real problem is that the chemicals that we use in agriculture all drain into the ocean. DDT, PCBs that we used a great generation ago still persist in the ocean. Because plastic and these chemicals are both petroleum based, plastic absorbs super high concentrations of these persistent organic pollutants. When the fish eat them, it dissorbs in their flesh and enters into the food web, becoming more and more concentrated. So the impact of persistent organic pollutants is endocrine disruption. The impacts on wildlife and humans are very similar as we share a very similar endocrine system. There's seeds here and there. And it was Dr. Theo Holborn who first recognized the transgenerational effects of endocrine disruption. If you would like a truly apocalyptic and disturbing view of life in our commercial age, a book called Our School and Future is really insightful. Humans are also exposed to endocrine disruption through direct exposure from pesticides, pesticides, fertilizers, flame retardants, and food packaging, canned foods, and whatnot. The, in, the effects include infertility, obesity, diabetes, ADHD, autism, cancer. She started an organization in Colorado, actually, the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, which is a platform for scientists to gather information and share it around this disruption, which is really difficult because the transgenerational effects, when I'm exposed as my son or grandchildren, who carry the impact. It's really difficult to prove scientifically, but they're starting to. In her book, she describes how chemicals used anywhere in the world one enter the food web, as I described, but they can also be picked up by an air or water current anywhere in the world very easily. Which means that chemicals used in industrial agriculture anywhere can arrive at our doorsteps and do arrive at our doorsteps. 
should care about their farmers. And that's what comes. So I came to this first Terra Madre from a residency I was doing in France at La Magula Foundation. And there I was making images out of collaged plastic that were little fish on the sea. The, the plastic made up their bodies to reflect this kind of internalization of the animals. And when having a conversation with this fisherman, I started thinking about, you know, how one do we reflect the problem without sensationalizing it or misrepresenting it? I don't want to show the seals that are tangled up in fishing net and being strangled because people aren't inspired by grotesque images. It, it doesn't make them want to do something. It just kind of grosses them out. And there's too much information in the world so that they end up just turning away. So I started copying these images onto little repurposed pieces of foam core, and I made an installation that people can interact and move around, exploring the, the inner relations in the mom and food web. And then I started asking people to add to it with their own images of fish. It's growing into a global collaboration with participants throughout the United States, the Caribbean, Europe, and I just returned from Asia, participation as well. I feel with this wide range of voices, we can come together and make a very powerful statement around this myth, this material that, that literally connects us all in this language. I don't want to impose my own ideas of solutions because solutions look different in every place in the world. And so I'm open to people using it as an educational tool and then returning the images to the overall collaboration. This makes it work on a local level, engaging especially kids, and then it comes together as a big call for awareness, questioning what I feel are misplaced notions of disposability and waste that has come in with an industrialized culture. So, slow food, I feel, is one of the most important movements in the world today. It empowers farmers to maintain traditional practice Farmers are on the forefront of the battle with climate change, and they offer solutions based on deep understandings of place, the microclimates, season, the nature of their land, the quality of their water, and how to work with the lack of it. They work in harmony with the land, maintaining biodiversity, and providing food security. The gathering at Terra Madre tackles some of our most pressing environmental and social challenges while creating and celebrating the joy of community that is built around the traditions of sharing nourishment. They offer solutions that are attainable by everyone. Know where your food comes from and prepare it with love. You can grow your own, even if it's a pot of herbs. Get to know your local farmers and support them. Preparing food with love is an opportunity for us to come together with our families, spend time preparing and breaking bread together supports community. So we brought the Monarch Project, which I mentioned this morning. Um, and I hope you'll all fill out a better fly. Um, and I think this kind of project is important. I was inspired 
um, by the fact that the first citizen science project was developed in exploring the migration of the monarch. And I love that idea of participation along the whole migration. So together with Susanna Mitchell, um, we developed a series of prints that can be engaged with here and used again as an educational tool for kids. I feel that kids are essential partners in activism. Because as they learn about these issues, they carry it back to the hearts of their families. Those are messengers that we listen to. It's also, I've been presenting a lot for scientists or scientific organizations. And I feel it's important to bridge science in the community. And art is a good tool to do that. People aren't going to spend time reading a scientific paper. Our lives are too fast. Nah. But they do engage, it's hands-on, especially young people. And they do engage, and through hands-on and creative outlets, we can learn about our world. So at Terra Madre, I really pursued the food justice movements they have numerous panels with participants from all over the world. And it was frightening to hear the commonalities, especially through the Southern Hemisphere, of what people are confronted by as they try to maintain their traditions. Land grab. Corporations work with governments to literally take land away from farmers. Farmers are displaced. Crops are grown for export, which decimates the social and economic fabric of a community. Food insecurity quickly follows. Farmers aren't able to grow enough food for their communities. Hunger leads to revolt. Choosing to eat from an industrialized food system supports these structures. Last winter, I participated in the ghetto biennial in Haiti. I worked with grandmothers in the Gongru community, following them around as they bought and prepared food for the community. They recorded their recipes. But instead of an outside ethnographic reflection of this place, they wanted to explore the connections that I, as an American, and my country represents through the history with our relationship with Haiti. I'm going to do a reading on Thursday or Friday afternoon <laughs> that has grown from this. But pretty much I use the recipes as a framework to explore the collisions, of taking a historical perspective, as well as offering a very personal vignette of this community who is one of the poorest communities in the Western Hemisphere, offering insights into why, offering a critique into our own actions and what that is because I think that it is vital to question our
Tosman, el primer Tianguis, uno de los Tianguis, porque antes hubo un proyecto que se llamó La Carpa, y ahora eh, desde el año 2000, 2010 eh, pertenece y es uno de los iniciadores del Tianguis Orgánico aquí en San Miguel de Allende. Él también eh, estuvo en un proyecto, es un proyecto muy interesante que se llama este, eh, Los surcos que inició con otro compañero, ellos se eh, producían, se ponían en contacto con diferentes eh, agricultores y, y tenían su, sus canastas básicas y las iban a repartir a, a varias personas interesadas en, en, en los vegetales orgánicos. Eh, él ahora está eh, junto con otras personas en una tienda que se llama La Bodega, es una tienda donde se vende alimentos orgánicos y donde también hay muchos productores, procesadores y es una tienda importante aquí en San Miguel. Ahora también él está muy en contacto con otros grupos de personas, tanto mexicanos como extranjeros, para hacer conciencia también de lo, que, de lo que pasa en nuestro mundo y lo que pasa concretamente en el lugar donde vivimos, aquí nos ha tocado vivir a mí y a muchos de ustedes eh, va a hablar sobre el banco de semillas él tiene mucho contacto con muchísimos eh, compañeros que trabajan la tierra muchos agricultores aquí en, en San Miguel eh, yo tengo el, el gusto y el honor de ser compañera somos compañeros de trabajo y estamos en muchos proyectos también forma parte de la cooperativa Cuna Verde eh, Cúrate donde se está produciendo este árbol que es la moringa y estamos iniciando también la estrella y pues cedo el micrófono a mi compañero commercialize or barter or whatever your seeds, they need to be on this national list. 
but the national list is designed to keep big businesses going and small businesses get rid of them. So uh, local seed banks exist and have existed since the beginning of time. Uh, mostly it was um, a job that was carried out by the first women in this case that were apparently, is what I've been told, that thousands of years ago were collecting edible plants, wild plants, and saw that they could ca gather the seeds. And I think it's established that f women were the first farmers that, re that really, you know, and I think men were more hunting. It's probably a sexist thing to say nowadays, but I'm just going back in time. I'm not, I'm not saying <laughs> men can't be farmers. I consider myself a farmer, and I'm a man. <laughs> so, but the point is, uh, it's nice to think that it's something, it's like babying an infant. I have a child of my own, and as my child reaches his fourth and fifth year, I spend a lot more time being a lot more active with my son. But when my son was a baby, his mother took very good care of him. And seeds are like little babies. And to think that they've been treasured for thousands of years, a lot of times by women. My neighbor's a local farmer who grows corn. He's been growing for 25 years. Corn, beans, and squash on the local cornfield. And uh, his wife, he takes the horse plow, and his wife goes behind and plants the seeds. And I've seen them do that three years in a row now. And it's, it's, it's uh, a nice, anyways. To think that all of that is being replaced by large <laughs> Monsanto seed inter interest that are gonna, you know, commercial seeds is a very sad thing. So, seed banks, what is a seed bank? What is a seed library? A seed bank is usually a climate controlled uh, could be a small closet, could be a big warehouse, it doesn't matter. It could be freezers, could be a cool, dry place. There's really simple seed banks, there's really complicated seed banks. But a seed bank is just an area that you store seeds. And it's a place that needs to be very hygienic, but it doesn't need to be very expensive to set them up. There's seed bank initiatives all around Mexico, and there's projects where people are uh, connecting different regional seed banks to more national uh, although locally run, run by grassroots people from the bottom up. So there, it, it's happening in Mexico, but it's really at the very beginning stages compared to Europe or the United States. Uh, most of the seeds that are grown in San Miguel organically are contraband. The seeds that come from the U.S. Contraband because if you bring organic seeds or heirloom seeds or open pollinated seeds, seeds that are part of this traditional food system, several thousands of years old, if you want to bring seeds in from the states like heirloom, heirloom amaranth from New Mexico or Arizona, something like that, like one that was brought in four or five years ago called Hopi Red, Red Amaranth. If you want to bring that in here, you have to treat it with a chemical fungicide because the laws of this country are such that they will not allow seeds to come in unless they're treated uh, with fungicides. So obviously if you want to keep the organic integrity of your seed, you can't be treating with chemicals at the border before it comes to the country. So what all of us are forced to do is pay what's called a coyote, somebody that comes over the border, and you pay, you bribe them to bring your organic seeds without going the legal route, which would, you know, make them not organic, treat them with chemicals. So if you want clean seeds, it's illegal to bring clean seeds into Mexico. Yet it's what everybody does. All the organic farms from, you know, <laughs> Chihuahua, the Chiapas, you name it, everybody in Mexico does that, this. And in San Miguel, there's quite a few organic farms now. There have been for you know, about 15 years a few large ones, but now there's many, many small ones. So it's a problem, because most of these people don't have access to paying money, don't know how to order the seeds from an online seed, a seed catalog that's related to a seed bank, or at least a seed company in the U.S., like Johnny Seeds in Maine, like Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa, like New Mexico has a great one also. Yeah, seeds have changed, thank you. And they're all over the place and we get seeds from high mowing seeds also. Anyways, there's a lot of organic seed companies that sign GMO free pledges. That means that they will never knowingly sell a seed uh, that's genetically modified. So we look for those seed companies that have those pledges in the US. We go on the internet, we order our seed order, they get shipped to a mailbox in Laredo, and then somebody picks it up in Laredo, Texas, and smuggles it over the border, 
and delivers it here in San Miguel. And there's a huge fee involved in doing that. So sometimes it's five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, and you can imagine a small farmer can't pay that kind of money. So the need for a local seed bank is huge. Now, a seed bank implies, okay, you come, you drop off, like money, you drop off your seeds in a bank, in a vault or something, and then you take them when you want them. Uh, a seed library is very different. A seed library might have a, a vault, a closet, a climate control thing, but a library is enables a farmer to come, borrow, like a book from a library, borrow seeds, plant them, grow them out, obviously receive some kind of training so that they can propagate that seed and give back to the seed library maybe double, triple, ten times what they were given so that the seed library can have many more seeds every year to benefit many more farmers. So the seed library is a concept that's catching on in the U.S. and in Europe and in other countries. It's very new here in Mexico. About a year ago, we started, uh, we've talked about it with different organizations and different people for several years now, but about a year ago, or in September last year, we really said, let's do it. So we've been meeting and slowly putting together the project. We finally got a building to do it. We finally have a core group of people. Uh, we're going to be receiving uh, training from a fr friend and next colleague of mine, Jen Ungama, great girl here who's been seed saving. Well, she's my age, in her late 30s. Um, has a lot of experience saving seeds locally, and she's going to be one of our mentors for the seed bank. And she has a, another friend in Aguas Calientes who's going to help us, and another friend in Veracruz who will help us. So we will have different experts coming and teaching us how to save seed. Ironically, most of them are women. women. There's another one in Mexico City that has a project called uh, Canasta de Semilla, a very powerful lady who's helped organize multiple regional seed banks around Mexico. And we'll be plugging into these different networks of other seed banks. But we'll be receiving training uh, as we already have begun to receive training. Recently, there was a, a young man from Arizona who's part of Native Seed Search in Tucson, Arizona, who came and explained to us what a seed library looks like in the U.S. It was very inspiring. And so we're hoping to really be able to give local farmers, uh, loan them seeds, get them back, and loan them to more farmers. So that's a pretty simple concept. Now, one of the projects that we've been working on for the last four years is certification, organic certification. I want to talk really quickly about that in relationship to seeds. If you go and you buy seeds, what? How do you know that it's GMO free? Well, because if you have a local grassroots organization that is producing that seed, their moral character or their personal convictions are such that they would never sell you a GMO seed. But there is a lot of quasi-organic seed companies around the world now that are buying seeds from Seminus and other large, huge seed companies uh, that are full, completely polluted or contaminated, or whatever the word is, with GMO seeds. And they're being passed off as you know, as regular seeds that aren't genetically modified. So you need a system that says, okay, the seeds that we're giving this farmer or loaning to this farmer are not genetically modified. How do you know? The only tool that we're aware of here to certify that something is not genetically modified is organic. Now the word organic has a good or bad reputation depending how you look at it because it is sort of a bureaucratic process and a lot of small farmers or grassroots organizers don't like bureaucracies that prevent illiterate farmers from engaging in the system. So we've worked hard in the last four years to work on uh, the peer certification system, which I'm going to explain now, which is a way of certifying small farmers that's a lot less bureaucratic and a lot less expensive. Okay. A little bit of background. In 1972, IFOM, uh, International Forum of Organic Agricultural Movements, sort of like the uncontested International Organic Authority was set up. And it defined the principles of organic farming that were based on people like Rudolf Steiner in Europe, Austrian guy who started biodynamics, Alan Chadwick in England who went on 
with John Jevons in California, created biointensive agriculture. Uh, also, R.J. Rodale, or J.R., I forget his, Rodale in the U.S. was one of the founders. So the different founding fathers of organic uh, agriculture in the 20s, 1920s, 30s, 40s, and through the wars. World War I and II, there was an excess of chemicals, and instead of killing people, they said, hey, we'll go kill insects, now there's no more war. We got all these chemicals, and we really need to keep getting these chemicals out of the marketplace and keep shareholders happy. So organic uh, farming was hugely popular for thousands of years on this planet until the Industrial Revolution, and then until World War I and World War II, all these chemicals really started flooding the countryside and getting out into, you know, so farmers started using insecticides to improve, improve crop yields, pick the crops from insects, and then they realized that, oh, the insecticides last year don't work this year, so you gotta use a more powerful insect, insecticide, et cetera, et cetera. So organic farming principles were starting to be really defined in those times. In World War I, World War II, people were saying, ooh, all these chemicals coming in are ruining, are gonna ruin the rivers, the oceans, people's health. We really need to do something about it. So there was a lot of organic activists, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and by the 70s, iPhone, this international body, we're talking about our international non-government organization, said, these are the guidelines, and they finally, by the 70s, had the guidelines. Those guidelines are available on the iPhone website. It's ifoam.org, I believe. If you can Google iPhone, it's a very popular organization. And so that um, international organization accredits certifiers. So you might go to the supermarket and buy something, or a local farmer's market, or whatever. You're looking for logos, certification logos, like USDA organic, or if you were in Japan, it'd be JAS, which is the Japan equivalent of that. Or in the EU, it's the EU organic certification. Mexico just this year finally got its national certification program together, and so Mexico has a national program. The point is, all of these different countries have agencies in the countries that carry out certification, but all these countries and agencies have to adhere to the international principles of organic farming. Now, the international principles of organic farming say GMOs or trans, uh, uh, yeah, any of the genetically modified seeds or foods in general are not permitted within the certified organic food system. So if you're creating a seed bank and you want to offer farmers and consumers certainty that you're not giving them genetically modified seeds. Well, the only tool that you have, really, is using the iPhone international principles and say, we are going to have multiple farmers growing in this seed bank system, seed library system, and we're going to make sure that they're all certified. OK, well, it's thousands of dollars to get organic certifications. So how's that going to work? So what we did four years ago is say, we're going to iPhone has a system for developing countries like Mexico, and they, it's called peer certification where different people in a local food system certify each other. So if you're a farmer, and you're a farmer, and you're a farmer, we go together and say, okay, but we'll go see her, who's also a farmer, and we will all get some kind of basic training, and we'll go make sure she's doing things properly. That's peer certification, we're peers. We're not a for-profit company. If you were a for-profit for profit company, you'd be like Oregon Tilth, certifying company. In Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, certifies a farm right here in San Miguel. And they charge them thousands of dollars a year to say they're organic. Well, why not do it amongst ourselves? And in the farmer's market, when we set up that system, we had to get trained by the University of Chapingo and the National Organic Farmer's Market Network. We did that. We got some kind of a recognition from iPhone also, and there's continual training. One of our colleagues, Luis Suarez, um, who couldn't make it right now, but he uh, has gone through a lot of different <laughs> trainings in Latin America in general to become accredited. So he and Jolan and myself and others have a, set up a, an organization several years ago to, do, to carry out your certification. We charge $40 or 500 pesos 
forty dollars is a uh, administration fee for our sec our secretary to archive each farm's you know there's an archive for each farm when they were last visited what are the conditions that make them maintain their organic status what are the recommendations that they need to be used not use river water use the shallow well water or blah 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 there's a lot of so there's a lot of archives. There's a lot of paperwork, but not so much paperwork for the farmer. And then there is a certain amount of paperwork that the farmer has to do. And we've really struggled. It's really been hard to get them, because a lot of them are illiterate, to fill out the paperwork. Because we have to show the federal government and iPhone and the other NG, organic NGOs that, yes, they really are organic. And you can't just say, oh, because they're our friend, they're organic. Say, look, they have a management plan. What's a management plan? Kind of like a business plan and says, I'm going to rotate these crops, corn, beans, and squash, or I'm going to plant them together. Whatever you do, you have to write it on paper and have it documented. It's called a management plan. And then you have to have a log. A log says, Today I went out in my bean field and I saw that the grasshoppers ate all my beans. Did I apply DDT? No. I used the chili extract powder in such and such proportions and blah, blah, blah. So that's part of the log book. So if you get audited by the Mexican federal government that now regulates the use of the word organic, you need to be able to show, hey, here you go. This is what we're applying to fight the grasshopper. So this is what we're, we're using netting for grasshopper, whatever you're using. So the logbook and the management plan are two tools that provide as much transparency as you can to the governing you know, authorities in organic. So that's difficult. Because a lot of these farmers are illiterate, and getting them to do a management plan, I had a hard time making my management plan. It's really so. We're now setting up a slew of workshops that will be focused on getting small farmers to do their management plans. Say, so here's how you do a management plan. Okay, what do you do? Well, I plow my cornfield after the after the earth is wet six inches down or a foot down, and blah blah blah. So just get them to tra we transcribe what their practices have been all these years and document their practices so that we really can give them organic certification so that when a consumer comes to the farmer's market says, hey, how do I know that corn isn't genetically modified? Oh, because she's our friend or he's our friend? No, because they have a management plan, because the visits are open to the public. So this year we've made the visits open to the public again like we did back in the day. We're doing it again. So any consumer can come along and visit the farm. So if you really want to know where the corn is coming from or where the lettuce or arugula or whatever it is they're growing. So open transparency as much as possible. It's very difficult. This is a very difficult process. But that's so when the seed bank is up and running, which is going to take about a year to really get it going the way we want it going. It's a lot of fundraising, a lot of training. You'll be able to go to the seed library and say, look, these seeds are certified organic, these seeds are in transition, and these seeds are heirloom seeds that aren't certified, but they're uh, non-treated, and etc. So there'll be different categories in the seed bank for depending on what, you know, what certification status they are. But the only one that you, the only way you'll really know if they're not Monsanto infiltrated seeds is if they go through all these processes, which are very difficult. One last really quick example why this is important. As a lot of you probably know this, I don't know what the latest statistic is, but about 10 years ago they were saying that Monsanto owned patents on over 10,000 indigenous seeds. So Monsanto is improving corn in a laboratory and then saying to the farmer, okay, I'm going to sell this to you, and it's going to improve your crop yields. And they buy the seed and they plant it and they realize it wasn't adapted to local conditions. And like in India, all the farmers that bought, bought into the Monsanto cotton system, they ran in, in themselves into debt by buying these improved cotton seeds that were sold with organic, with uh, cotton pesticides and fertilizers. And they go into debt and there's mass suicide because all these Indi uh, Indian farmers that can't pay their debt. So the idea of having Monsanto control the seed is a horrifying idea. The idea that a farmer can save his or her own seed year after year after year is really important. Why is Monsanto improving seeds in the laboratory and selling them and then going and patenting indigenous seeds? Well, because 
if they patent the indigenous seeds, if they decode the seeds and patent them, then they can say, hey, that's my intellectual property. So all you farmers that are using that seed that your grandparents developed, can't do that anymore because, you know what, I patented your seed. It's like Christopher Columbus coming over and said, oh, all of you Indians need to go because this is now my place. This belongs to Spain. It, it, it's colonialism. It's a horrible type of colonialism. So the idea that Monsanto is going to come in and say, all these indigenous seeds are Monsanto's intellectual property is a, it's a terrible. And that, that's been happening. Uh, it's all, they probably own all of the, the genes of all the seeds that are being grown locally, and one day they'll enforce them. I don't know, it's, it's probably too late, but there are things that we can still do to defend the rights of local farmers, and the seed library is one of them, and certification can help defend their practices to the public at large. So it's about control. We want control to stay in the hands of the small farmers, not the large corporations. Thank you. Quiero presentar ahora a John Ferguson. Ferguson. Él es un periodista, es canadiense, es un periodista retirado. Eh, es una persona que colabora activamente en el Centro para la Justicia Global. Él eh, tiene a su cargo unos viajes muy interesantes a, 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 con grupos cooperativos y aparte de todo esto es un gran aficionado por la comida saludable y él nos va a hablar un poco ahora sobre su experiencia y sus intereses sobre este tema. Ok, this now is a focus on understanding the reality of the corporate world and how unbelievably destructive it is. So this is about moving beyond processed food capitalism to get a much healthier diet. The initial focus of this speech is to disclose the reality of how processed food corporations actually operate, as well as the truth of what they produce. Clearly, it is constantly kept secret. Propaganda is the major method these food corporations use to seduce people to massively overconsume so-called healthy processed foods. Globally, many humans have moved away from eating traditional nutritious food. Now they buy more cheap processed food that clearly contains very low quality nutrients and lots of dangerous hidden ingredients. This enormous human diet switch to processed foods is a main factor in the extensive global destructive growth of obesity. Now at least 2.1 billion people are well overweight or obese, including a serious number of children. This obesity growth is causing a serious surge in human health problems, such as diabetes, heart risk, cancer, high blood pressure, allergic reactions, Alzheimer's, dementia, and others. And obesity now has been shown in a recent study that it can really seriously reduce life expectancy by at least 14 years. Major food corporations, quote, are well aware of the health crisis their products cause, end of quote. A recent New York Times article stated, obviously there will not be any needed quality improvement in processed foods. Excessively rich corporate food executives clearly know that any reduction of overconsumption of their corporate processed junk food could seriously reduce their profits. Without a doubt, this reveals how destructive processed food capitalism is on human lives all around the planet. The continuous tyranny of processed food. Corporate propaganda and false labor keeps all consumers and children unthinkingly addicted to junk food. At this point, it is known that about 80% of all processed foods in America contain undisclosed GMO ingredients. Two secret uses of GMOs in processed foods are cheese, which can contain GMO soy milk in chemical color, ketchup, which can contain GMO tomatoes, and high fructose corn syrup that contains toxic mercury. The growing consumption of food is secretly loaded with GMOs, especially those from, as we had, Monsanto. The GMOs in processed foods result in dangerous toxins, even Agent Orange being stuffed into human bodies. 
so many people are unconsciously locked into just using their taste buds to decide what to buy and then to stuff into their bodies. This clarifies why many people on the planet get serious obesity health destruction because of the low level nutrients, lots of toxic sugar, salt, GMO, vegetable oils, and fats that are in processed foods constantly. Two recently revealed major toxics loaded in processed foods could seriously harm brains. They are hexotoxin, a fake flavor enhancer, aspartame, an artificial sweetener in sodas and chewing gum. Another wonderful thing about how good people use corporate propaganda like chewing gum. And I'll certainly talk about a few others. Both of these are good examples of highly dangerous ingredients secretly used by major corporations. Now, it's really interesting to see that the federal government in America, since 1938, has not forced any food corporations to give serious public disclosure of their processed food labor to properly disclose the reality of their contents, especially in the GMOs. Massive corporate processed food money given to political parties has eliminated any authentic government regulation and proper labeling of processed foods. The top USA food expert, as you all know, Michael Pollan, just a brilliant guy, asked how could the nutritious, notorious junk food made by major processed food corporations always pass away through the Food and Drug Administration and be claimed by false corporate labeling as a health food? Guess what? current executive of the FDA is a former executive from Monsanto. <laughs> Pretty clear. This is a clear example of how capitalism has eliminated any serious government regulation to force the processed food industry to publicly disclose the reality of their contents. Continuous corporate propaganda endlessly seduces humans to buy processed food products, given bogus labeling words such as, and all of you know these words, and it's really fun to study and think about what they really mean. Natural. Processed foods secretly contain lots of artificial ingredients, especially GMOs, which are 100% non-natural and loaded with the dangerous toxins and very low nutrients. Healthy. The processed food corporations never reveal that many products contain significant amounts of sugar, salt, GMO chemicals, and all forms of fats. Delicious. Most processed foods contain weird, fake flavors. All those tastes. And guess who exposed Velveeta cheese in 1973? Guess what it is? It's not cheese. It's dead cheese shipped from corporations, from supermarkets, back to Kraft. And for, to prevent Kraft losing money, they made a new cheese by putting color in it, and a flavor in it, and baking it, and selling it as one of the world's top. Jesus, it is just shit. And I exposed that in the television show I created at the CBC of Canada. <laughs> and um, the, yeah, most processed foods contain weird fake flavors created with chemicals, GMO, soy syrup, sugar, and salt. This propaganda also promotes similar highly suspicious words like tasty, yummy, and sweet. And again, I say before, cheap. This corporate seduction persuades people to spend less money to buy cheap food. And we're going to go into showing how there's wonderful solutions. Another good example of corporate labeling deception is that major industrial meat companies never reveal that the meat and chicken they are selling were grown in dangerous industrial farm factories and fed with GMO corn, GMO soybeans, and GMO grains. This so again is how do you buy meat at supermarkets? <laughs> this gives industrial processed meat loads of dangerous fats and toxic chemical inserts in much lower nutritional levels because of the lack of green eating by the animals. The negative corporate processed food impact on the Western diet. It is now obvious, given the corporate domination of the Western diet over the past five decades, that it is by far the most damaging diet in the world. A number of traumatic examples of other dangerous processed foods are bread. Heavily refined white flour bread is nutritionally insignificant and loaded with sugar. 
Now, here are by far the three absolute lowest quality foods in the world and really dangerous. The two first ones are so-called meat, which you'll see is suspect. Hamburgers and hot dogs. In these highly damaging industrial processed junk products, is there any real meat included? Much of it is fake, so-called meat. It is loaded with a lot of fat, sugar, and salt. These are two of the lowest absolute quality foods in the world. Now, the lowest one is French fries. These fried potatoes are dangerously loaded with pesticide toxins and are considered one of the top three foods to eliminate because of the health impact. Now, the other one, and again, I'm sure some of you have done some studying on this, is milk. Processed milks have been found to include GMO soy milk, whey, caustic soda, cane sugar, detergent, and even toxic compounds like melanin, a recent report found. And then the last one we'll talk about is cereal. It was found that cereals contain high amounts of GMOs, especially Kellogg's, as well as processed white sugar, processed flour, and suspect GMO vegetable oil. The global growth of constant use of cheap junk food moving into another for-profit operation is easy to see in such as hospitals and major airlines. Their use of less expensive foods helps them reduce their costs and probably increase their profits. How to obtain a superior anti-capitalist food solution? It is now very clear that all we need to do studying to determine whether or not we can change our diet habits and back away from consumption of all corporate processed foods. In America, five decades ago, people spent an average of about 17% of their national income on buying food. Currently, they're spending between 7% and 9% on cheap processed foods, by far the lowest level of any major countries in the world. It is very clear that since the processed food dominated the Western diet, and of course, as you know, the Western diet is all around the world. It's not just America. Um, national income health care spending in the U.S. went from 5% to now a 60%. Oh, oh, oh. No, there it's coming back. <laughs> um, a recent study reported that obese Americans are spending $300 billion a year on health care bills in the major processed food obesity health products. Obviously, another positive option to move away from the Western diet is to make your health care spending go down somewhat. So that's clear that will really work on two levels extremely well, is if you use a little more individual spending on local and organic food, then over a period of time, your health care spending will go down quite a bit. And you'll obviously feel much healthier and better. So that's the nice thing to think about. Okay, here is the second phase of this to just talk about how to get healthy in food. It is vital for people to do serious thinking and studying on how to escape the Western diet in order to learn how to have a much healthier life and live longer and have much better daily energy. Here in San Miguel, we have a very good food model. We can buy significant high quality local organic food and seriously get away from processed food by not shopping in supermarkets. It was wonderful to learn recently that this country has done something unbelievably positive. Scotland government announced it's going to become a good food nation. The federal government plans to work with the rural communities to increase the production and sale of locally grown food. This will work well to improve human health because the big problems of obesity there are a problem in farmer economic stability. In addition, another country the new peaceful military government in Thailand is now working hard to restore organic agriculture to support sustainable farming. With a lot of study, I learned that there was a serious quality difference between the industrial for profit processed food and traditional historic food. Of course, much of you know this, that the historic food was created by a good number of indigenous groups here in Mexico and Peru. Continuously, this traditional food is much more nutritious than all the corporate processed food. 
again, according to Michael Pollan, the important start for a diet of vision is to begin eating a wide variety of natural greens. It should include vegetables, herbs, solid greens, and much less food that is red, especially with the dubious industrial factory farm meat. And which again is a major factor of global warming. A recent study stated that uh, for the obesity problem, there are particularly good types of food to eat to reduce human belly fat growth. It suggests to eat the following, and I'm, I'm sure a good number of you know this, and we get these at the organic market on Saturday, various types of kale leaves, and those are incredibly healthy for you. And the one vegetable that's just, as you all know, that you eat a lot is broccoli. And both of those help reduce belly fat growth. They're really good for you. Avocados that help reduce healthy fats, they have healthy fats that help you avoid fat growth. And then one of the other top foods that uh, it's really interesting, a lot more people are understanding the eating than the benefits. And they provide the benefits of high fiber diet, including better digestion. Also, one of the world's current top nutritional foods originated by the Mexican Azteca indigenous groups is semilla chia, as we call it, chia seed. It is wonderfully healthy for everyone. I have it just a teaspoon of water for every morning. Drink it, get the energy, and all the, 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 the protein, the vitamins, the fibers, the omega 3 oil. This is just, again, 100% natural. It was very interesting in a science study about five years ago that the Azteca group was found to be the healthiest human group ever underground in the planet. And guess who's rated number two? The lions. And again, because they created so much of what was just balanced. It's just wonderful to see that. Of course, another major nutritional need that has developed by indigenous groups around the world are insects. The protein, vitamins, and other needs are very high. And that's why, as all of you know, the United Nations Food Program has promoted the use of this for human health in the future. And again, it's very easy to use. You just chop it up, blend it, put it in soup, and you can just use it really easy. And I took a, a couple to a restaurant in um, Bernal uh, on Tuesday, yesterday. And uh, the restaurant there had tacos with grasshoppers and cheese. And again, it was just wonderful. Now you have to do a lot of chew to get it done. But you know, just wonderful. Um, now the other thing, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, and this is really interesting, cooking wisely at home. Here's another important diet factor to help create a good diet change. It is important to plan well in advance as to what, to, what specific food to buy to make your own meals at home and build a detailed written list of food needs every time you go shopping. And that, again, is really a wonderful aspect of a number of side studies that show that. And if you carry a little list of food needs, you just buy those, and you don't get a serious supply of sorts of other stuff that you don't need for your food. So it's, again, a very smart way to make sure you get all the right stuff. A good science study has indicated that families who learn to cook a family and create their own unique meals will easily acquire a wider variation of healthy nutritious meals. Another interesting study indicates that you need to make a good positive cooking practice reform and back away from previous fast cooking methods. It suggested there are two very bad cooking practices, all forms of frying and the use of microwaves, both of which can easily destroy the nutrients in all of the food that's being cooked. And it's very important for you to know that. And again, there's probably solutions. I'll show you that. But if you cook it very slowly, then you don't lose the nutrients. And so there's nice ways to do it. So you should all know that. So this is uh, um, this is. Uh, is easily the best cooking pot you could ever have. And this is the name on the back is Le Crusade from France. 
I've had this for 11 years, and you just can't believe how the foods you cook in this, and how you never lose nutrients. And again, you find the metal. Again, side studies have shown that metal can be the best, but it's better. It's a good metal, so there's definitely not as many problems. But again, this is just a good example of how you can actually make really interesting food by having a really, really effective cooking method. It's a little heavy. And uh, the, uh, I had it for 11 years. Now let's think about the diverse types of local food to use for interesting cooking. And again, this is, and I'm sure a number of you know this, the variety of special traditional ingredients can help you create much more diverse natural flavors, seriously non-fake corporate chemical flavors, for many types of meals. Every day I use a wide range of healthy, natural, local ingredients for creating an interesting cooking method. I use five or six herbs because, again, all of you, I'm sure, have seen that herbs are now considered extremely important to eat given the health range of all of them and how it's historic from China and really positive ex uh, impact on health. So, again, and again, I just put them all, I trim them off, and put them in water, and dry them up. And then on a sandwich, I put a little coconut oil on the bread, very small, and a little pesto, and a little salsa, and a little turmeric, a sprinkle turmeric. And then I put the herbs on top of it, and then a little cheese. And again, only local cheese for breakfast. And I grill it. And again, you just can't believe how extraordinary the flavor is and the health of the ingredients is just fabulous. So you, you can, again, it's just so easy to find really lovely things. So, um, and of course, you all know, you've all tried lots of salsas, and you find some that are a little too uh, dangerous for you, uh, but there's others that are true. And the same with moles. And again, it's very easy to find a wide range of curries that you can use, some of which are very heavy, but others are much lighter. So there's lots of options. And then, of course, three things which everybody recommends, all the science studies, that everybody should eat in every meal, garlic, ginger, and turmeric on a wide range of, as I said, the healthy herbs. And what I do is I use wine for cooking. And again, just how I can get uh, very interesting rosé wines from Argentina, uh, not that rosé, and a couple from uh, Carrero. And again, the cooking that you can get with this, and the way it expands the flavor and it makes the cooking work so well, Especially if you're using rice, risotto, and stuff like that. So again, it's a it's a nice other way to make your meals so good. Another cooking study indicates that you need to have reasonably daily time available for cooking to rebuild your health. I normally cook between one and two hours every day, and I love it. And of course, what I do is I put a little music on it when I'm doing all the cooking, and of course, it just makes it feel incredible. And the study suggests moving over, a study suggests that moving from couch sitting and television watching to get into the kitchen and have good emotional, physical, and intellectual time periods to cook. Clearly, it is far healthier to cook and eat at home than to eat outside in many restaurants. But all of you now know we get changes for that. However, there are a number of small restaurants here in San Miguel that are focused on making high-quality food with local farm ingredients. The same is happening in a number of good cities such as Edinburgh, Dublin, London, Paris, New York, San Francisco, Toronto, and Vancouver. This great high-quality food focus by restaurants is also doing well in Mexico City. Try the great Castle Land Museum restaurant. Uh, in a wonderful Alvar Obregón Street in Colonia Roma. Uh, just a couple of other quick things. Um, what they have, a science study, a very recent science study, showed that it really is important
to not use any types of potato chips because they're processed potato chips and they've got toxins in them. And corn chips, only especially if, of course, they're GMO corn chips, if they're natural. Local corn chips is perfect. Popcorn, GMO, soybean oil, and canola oil are both GMO. Now, just quick to show you this. This was a brilliant science study done in Scientific American May on habits. And the information you learn from what you can do to change your habits and you know make yourself more flexible and everything. But just if you can study this online, it's just incredible. And then just one um, yeah. Okay, so uh, this conceivably, this conceivably will work well around the world when many humans switch to local non farming food. Hopefully, this will soon result in a sharp decline in corporate processed food profits. This would be a superb result in our moving beyond the globally damaging capitalism of corporate process. Gracias, gracias. Me toca turno ahora a Peggy Rivas. Ella es una maestra de la Universidad de Berea y es una colaboradora muy cercana con el Centro para la Justicia Global. En años pasados participó en proyectos muy interesantes con el intercambio de estudiantes de diferentes partes del mundo. Eh, ella siempre ha sido una mujer muy inquieta y siempre interesada en la alimentación. Esperamos que pronto esté ya eh, a la luz su libro sobre alimento especial y le damos la bienvenida a Peggy que nos hablará sobre, sobre este tema que a ella le gusta mucho. <risa> In 2005, I attended the World Social Forum in Mumbai, India. It was a thrill to be in a space where I was a handful of Western people among 100,000 others from civil society in India. And during that period of time, about a week of the Social Forum, food activist Banana Shiva led a three-day workshop looking at the question of food and justice across the world. One day was devoted to women and water. Another day was devoted to bringing food producers from all over the world to talk about their struggles against Monsanto and cargo companies to keep their families and their lands alive. It was a wonderful moment for me. And on the last night of this conference, I lay wide awake in appreciation of Anana Shiva's commitment and energy and witness to the movement toward food justice in the world and making the world a safer place for all of us. I was also haunted because I realized I live in Kentucky, seven hours from the front door of Monsanto's corporate headquarters. And Banana lives in India, and she's taking this on. At that moment in my life, in my sleeplessness, I made a decision. It was an epiphany. I knew that my work for the rest of my life was to work for food justice. Well, following the tutelage of John Dewey, the American philosopher, if you want to learn something, you start where the student is. Where was I? I was in Berea College teaching women's studies and directing a women's studies program. So I decided to change the way I taught and the way I conducted research and bring the notion of feminism in food together. I began teaching new courses. One was called Most Edge. Another was called Take Back the Kitchen. And this, these courses represented a difference in how I normally teach. 
I invited students out of the classroom and into my home, where they'd watch movies, listen to me lecture, discuss books, but most importantly, to follow me into the kitchen where we prepared community meals for each other. And at the end of that, we sat and we broke bread together, we laid, as you were telling us earlier. The most interesting thing, and I'm going to pass these around just for people to see, I put books together at the end of the course with recipes and pictures of students as a memory of this experience of being out of the classroom into another way of learning. But taking back the kitchen is more than a college course for me. It is a visionary project to bring the fourth wave of feminism into being. A wave of feminism that challenges and transforms the dominant capitalist fast food economy. My argument is that the future of food belongs to those who have maintained and reclaimed the local production of food and maintained and preserved the traditional recipes and cooking low on the food chain. Like Vandana Shiva, I think we have to think big. The food economy needs to be restructured, and we need more women in the leadership. Now, as I moved into my research agenda on food and feminism, I had to go back to my intellectual mentor, Paulo Freire. He was the author of The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and his central idea was that people who live on the economic periphery have a very privileged understanding of the world, particularly as the world functions in favor of the wealthy. And if we think about it, people who live on the economic margins know what it means to be poor. They live in poverty every day, and they also cross the tracks, and they interact with the wealthy as servants, as, as gardeners, as people in the service industry. So from Freire's perspective, this group of people possesses a more accurate understanding of the world. And as a result, they are invited to the vocation of teaching the wealthy how to change our false consciousness so that we, too, can realize our full humanity. Well, that meant that I had to take my research into the spaces, the working spaces of women who live on the economic margins in the, at the edges of capitalist economies. And those workspaces are kitchens and gardens. From a Freirean perspective, it is in these simple spaces that we can see a movement back to the future that may be instrumental in the survival of all of humanity, particularly if there is a collapse in the food economy. Now today, my research has brought me right here to the state of Guanajuato. I've studied the women in their kitchens in the environs of San Miguel de Allende, and more recently in the environs of Dolores del Lago, with communities connected to Cedesa, the group we're going to be visiting on Saturday. I also received a Fulbright Fellowship to study traditional foods in southern India. On a recent sabbatical, I went to the townships. I spent five months working in the townships outside of Cape Town, South Africa, with a group of people who have begun the first community-supported agricultural program. And today, I'd like to share with you, introduce you a little bit to this group in, in uh, South Africa so that we can begin to see together the leadership that is growing around the world of women in this food revolution. So I need you to help. So we're going to go over here and try this. <coughs> Meet some of the leaders of the fourth wave of feminism. These are micro farming grandmothers from the poor and crowded black townships that surround the world's most beautiful city, Cape Town. The visionary behind the grandmothers is Mama Christina who started organizing gardens in 1989. Now she runs the mother organization, Abalini, which means farmers in Bosch. 
The new idea is to grow food where people are planted, is vacant lots. In the words of Abilene organizers, we ask the rich for their scraps of land and tell the poor that the door is open to a new life. The gardens in Google Lake Two are located behind that building. This is one of the vacant lots that provided for. Water and fertilizer are essential for these community gardens. And lucky for them, in Cape Town, they are very high water table. Mama Maybell grows seedlings and turns cow manure into fertilizer in less than six months and sells a bucket of fertilizer to micro farmers for 65 cents. Today, there are 2,500 micro farmers with home gardens and an additional 500 farmers engaged in community agriculture. Their practice is 50% of the produce goes to the family and 50% to the market. Abilene offers a four-day training program to help people learn how to plant these gardens. Abilene is predominantly female. In the beginning, men worked in the gardens with the women but the men pretended to take over and wanted to sell off the produce and not leave any for families. Ten years ago, the women kicked the men off the farms because they were not carrying their weight. To protect the financial interests of the community gardens, women have instituted a policy that each micro farmer must intern for one year before receiving a paycheck. As a result, most of the farmers are women because men do not want to wait a full year to put money in their pockets. These are the words of women, not mine. Abilene is deeply about farm development. It is a gardening revolution that connects people in the land with extraordinary consequences. In these areas of Kukuletu and Kailisha outside of Cape Town, community gardening has a profound impact on rebuilding community and healing the wounds of apartheid, thus creating a strong social fabric for the new South Africa. Like agribusiness, micro-farmers in Abilene are also subsidized because the cost of the manure, seeds, and seedlings exceeds what people can afford. The cost of subsidizing a micro-farmer is about $8 a month. Each home farmer supports five people. Each community micro farmer supports five families. The group really believes micro farming on vacant land is a model for sustainable agriculture and food sovereignty in South Africa. There is no shortage of vacant lots to grow food for the world's majority of poor. I would argue that Abilene represents the real green revolution the world desperately awaits. These community gardens now supply boxes of food to people all over Cape Town. In 2008, they serviced 70 households. Today, they supply 400 boxes of vegetables. A big box feeds four people for one week. Customers pay forward without knowing what produce they will get. That is the CSA model. Recipes always accompany the food that comes in the boxes. Unlike the days of apartheid, today at Abilene, Black African is run for the entire enterprise. Abilene also supports a people's garden that supplies fresh vegetables and herbs for the community kitchen where lunch and meals are prepared at very low prices. Today, we see fresh collards from the community gardens along with sugar beans for lunch. For me, this is taking back the kitchen from corporate agribusiness at its best. We are back at the Google Legends Garden, run by a group of octogenarians, mostly women who migrated to Cape Town from the Eastern Cape to work as domestics during apartheid. 
now retired and poor, these women are concerned about the futures of their families and how they help them build the new South Africa. They work four to five hours a day and bring a monthly income of $90. In truth, these micro-farming grandparents have not retired, but refired to save the planet. And they are the avant-garde for the next wave of feminism that will uproot the remnants of apartheid very deep in patriarchal cultures. Taking back the kitchen as feminist resistance to capitalist food culture needs to be the agenda for feminism's fourth wave. For all its historic movements, the heart of feminist protest is the patriarchy's control over the human body, and women's bodies in particular. Whether it's the right to enter a voting booth, take contraception, abort a fetus, dress freely, legislate against male rape, the core of feminist resistance is the right to sovereignty over one's body. The current global food economy threatens this sovereignty. The agenda for the fourth wave is the control over what goes on my plate. The right to healthy food is a human right that belongs to both women and men. Significantly, the fourth wave of feminism is decidedly not gender specific. Re envisioning and restructuring the food economy means all hands on deck. We are talking now about the future of food and the future of our lives, ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. Um, 
good afternoon, without being an expert. One of the conditions that the United States um, placed before Mexico prior to the signing of the free trade agreement was that the United States would uh, export corn into Mexico because it was much cheaper for the United States to produce corn. And I remember my mother telling me, the taste of tortilla is different. We don't know what happened, but it just tastes different. And this was, and then uh, Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution was changed uh, in order to allow the ejido to be dissolved and in, uh, I will not take too long with this, but uh, with the ejido dissolving, the, 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 the first, the main farm structure in Mexico was dismantled, in which the landowner had the obligation, the constitutional obligation to provide, besides the, the, uh, the draw uh, in the land, in, in the farm, uh, the, the salary, a piece of land, a small parcel for each of the workers uh, in order for them to have a dwelling and to have planting to supplement that. When that was dissolved, that was the beginning of Exodus. Now the United States does not only, we don't import corn, the United States dumps it in Mexico, which is illegal, talking about the wall and you know the illegal migrants, dumping is illegal, which means in economic terms to sell a uh, uh, product at a lower cost than it costs you to produce it. And that is illegal. I don't know if this is informative, but it's just a, a, a one of the many ways in which there's tremendous amounts of GMO corn. Um, and the job. I can also speak to the GMO corn question. Uh, Griffin Planet, I'm the program manager at Organica. So currently, um, yeah, the state of GMOs in Mexico, so GMO corn and GMOs, there's essentially a ban put in place as of um, this past October on any experimental plot. So majority of the GMOs that you have to be concerned about eating is going to be in processed food that contains um, palm oil, soy, um, any sort of corn syrup from the states. And that can be found in a lot of the junk food ch ch chatara that you can find here in Mexico. But generally, the elotes and the corn that you're buying on the streets, and even the tortillas, is probably hybridized corn that's still being sold by DuPont, Monsanto, Sagenta, companies like that. But it's most likely not GMO yet. So there's a, a large movement going on in Mexico right now to put a full ban in place. Um, but currently, the government's sort of revising the laws that are in place and all that. There's a whole large sort of, um, there's a large number of lawsuits currently in place in between smaller farmers and agriculturalists and the larger corporations. So currently the Mexican government's kind of putting in some regulations and it's it's a constant fight primarily taking place in Mexico City and across Mexico. So you still have to be aware and try to buy from from local farmers that are raising their own sort of local varieties of corn uh, because if you're buying large scale produced hybridized corn you're still supporting Monsanto you know, with, with corn being a crop that pollinates, air pollinates. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the issues with a lot of the experiment. There's experimental plots that Monsanto and these companies own all across Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, right now, they're supposedly on hold, although there's still a lot of allegations of them continuing to plant transgenic corn and other um, produce across Mexico. But it is one of the issues because you have farmers that are then experiencing essentially their own local varieties of corn being contaminated with these with pollen from, from uh, genetically modified corns. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, escuchando la exposición, eh, pues a mí me surge una pregunta bastante preocupante. Eh, creo que la mayoría de productores de alimentos como también de consumidores saben que se está produciendo comida chatarra y se está consumiendo comida chatarra la pregunta es ¿por qué se sigue produciendo y por qué se sigue consumiendo? ¿Sí? Eh, esa es la primera pregunta eh, creo que voy a recurrir a, a 
dos textos que en algún momento estaba leyendo que quizás pueda dar alguna respuesta a la pregunta que estoy planteando ¿no? porque, de por qué el, el, la producción de esta comida chatarra eh, Marx en un texto eh, titulado La miseria de la filosofía menciona que la producción de comida eh, barata va a constituir eh, como fundamental para la clase obrera sí, eh, la clase obrera en, en la medida en que eh, eso permitiría no subir los salarios ¿sí? mantener los salarios de acuerdo a la producción de alimentación y creo que eh, los, la mayoría que consume comida chatarra es la clase trabajadora ¿sí? porque no tiene posibilidades de consumir otros productos ¿no? y eh, también eh, de la justa de que se haya mencionado Bandana Shiva eh, también estaba leyendo el libro de ella de la cosecha global eh, en, ella, en ella menciona de que desde la fundación de la ciencia inmediatamente se manipula la naturaleza ahora es fácil de conseguir una manzana manipulada ¿sí? ahora como ya se dijo hace un momento, eh, el maíz y otro cereal. Entonces, eh, pues yo quería resaltar esto como un comentario con una pregunta. ¿Por qué se sigue produciendo alimentos chatarra? ¿Por qué se sigue consumiendo? Sí, esa sería la pregunta. Gracias.
against the corporate stuff. Okay, I'll uh, speak a little bit about the contamination of GMO uh, corn in Mexico. Uh, if you want details about this, a book I recommend is Marie Monique Robbins' The World According to Monsanto. It covers much more than this, but it details. The scientist who discovered the contamination of Mexican heirloom corn uh, underwent career-destroying attacks from Monsanto. Um, in January, I was here with Witness for Peace to look in Oaxaca to look specifically at the issue of transgenic uh, contamination. And we met with one of the remote rural farmer activists, and he said the Mexican government had given out free seeds through the, is it council, is the council, council? I don't remember his name. No, he was just a small farmer, and um, it's one of the magic Pueblo ecotourism town, but he's a foreign farmer there in rural Oaxaca. And it just this local. They used the, these government-supplied seeds, and they discovered that it was quite different and that it was spreading. And they organized to resist the seeds and to return to their heirloom. But the contamination, as you said, corn is widely cross-pollinated naturally. It's very difficult to get it out. But one of the best books is Mary Monique Robbins, The World According to Monsanto. She's got a trilogy, Our Daily Poison, The World According to Monsanto. And the most recent one is still in French. It may be in Spanish, but it's not in English yet. It would be called Crops of the Future, Moisson du Futur. Uh, the video is available online in French and with Spanish subtitles, but it's not available with English subtitles yet. So, uh, but a lot of it is interviewing American and Spanish farmers, so you get a, much of, a lot of different languages in it. But it's very thorough um, and can fill in a lot of the gaps that you might have. Um, I think about these questions all the time that you have just raised. Uh, why is it we eat food that we know isn't good for us? And I think that that probably needs to be a question to pose in groups, or collectivities, asking why do we do this? We know some of the answers that come right off the top of our heads. It's easy. My work's more important than my food. Um, I don't want to go out of my way to cook food, et cetera, et cetera. So what might be really useful is to begin doing what they did in Youngstown, Ohio, when they tried to buy the, the, the steel um, company. We saw this in a film today. Is get out and become involved in educational campaigns. Why do we do this? I'm not clear that poor people eat worse food than rich people. That doesn't feel right to me. That doesn't make sense to me. It's not what I have observed. And the work that we see going on in Avalini in the outskirts of Cape Town shows us that very poor people are eating very good food, are eating organic foods, and they're doing it in making gardens. Detroit, Michigan, which has virtually been abandoned by the white community, has more urban gardens. The Detroit Food Security Network rocks. It has more urban gardens than anywhere in the United States, and those are all poor people. So for me, I think we begin with ourselves, good old John Dewey, and say, why am I doing this? How do I legitimate it? And then from there we say, like Paul Ferry says, how do we organize to make a difference, to make a change? And we do one small thing on a long journey to impact and restructure the global community. I'm not sure where to start now because so, but to your question of why is the food still produced and why do we still eat it? It's so complicated. It is not only the food, or, you know, the U.S., yes, the subsidies, we promote that food and we throw money to industrial agriculture, but we also invest, the U.S. people and, you know, our population invests in the corporations. So there are alternative kinds of investments, which we're, I'm sure we're talking about all day today. So there's uh, also, you mentioned a book, there's another book and uh, that um, is and a movement that is taken um, from the slow food movement called Slow Money, that, um, that is a book written by Woody Tash. That's, the book is Slow Money, Investing as if Food, Farms, and Fertility Matter. And 
it's again just the grass again grassroots movement. You can um, invest in local farmers because that's the other thing is not only just eating it. The farmers need money to for their farms and and to um, make to produce more so that they can produce more in the farmers market and provide more. So lots of so slow money promotes. Um, small groups of people getting together to invest in local food systems. So that's one thing, and in fact, actually, in one of the first um, founder, uh, founders and directors was at Berea, is a teacher at Berea College, and the next um, big annual gathering is going to be in Kentucky, and in Louisville in November. And also, um, I'll be speaking at uh, slow food Terra Madre in October. So I don't know if anyone else is going to Terra Madre, but I just thought I would mention that in addition to the school board and how important it is to educate the children. And I'm from Los, Los Angeles and I do work in school gardens and I work in a low income school there and Los Angeles has hunger issues in Los Angeles and the US is a tremendous problem. I mean, you think that it's globally, one in six, I think it's something like that, that um, uh, U.S. people go, you know, have food hunger issues. So um, in the schools, I see that, you know, the families in, in our school really do why you choose cheap, it's cheap food because, again, with what you were talking about, slow food, people aren't paid a fair wage. If people were paid a fair wage and not subsidized, it wouldn't be as cheap. And just as you said, Jack, as, as the food has gone cheaper, the health care costs have gone higher. And there's a direct correlation with that and obesity. So, you know, all that question talks, like, touches on everything that we're talking about today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yo quiero comentar algo sobre la pregunta del compañero con eso. ¿Por qué seguimos comiendo lo que estamos comiendo? Es muy triste cuando no nos concientizamos de cosas muy importantes y una de las cosas más importantes empieza en nuestra casa, en nuestro hogar, con nuestros hijos, con nuestros nietos. Yo tengo mucha relación en las comunidades y me doy cuenta cómo, cómo es increíble cómo una, una madre, una mujer que empieza a ser madre desde a los 16 años, 20 años, a su bebé ya no le da la mayoría, no digo que todos, pero muchas mujeres ya no, ya no les dan eh, leche materna a sus hijos. He visto tristemente cómo a los bebés les dan en su biberón un refresco de Coca-Cola o, 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 o van a comer eh, las maruchan, este tipo de sopas. Y uno puede preguntar, son gente de campo, o, o, uno puede pensar en las ciudades, bueno, es, es la, la misma rapidez de la vida, en fin, pero están pasando muchas cosas en el campo. Yo siempre he pensado que todo se relaciona en qué conocimiento tengo yo, en dónde estoy parada, qué está pasando en mi mundo pequeño y también con mis vecinos. Ahora eh, en San Miguel están sucediendo cosas muy importantes e interesantes. Eh, al, al comenzar esta charla les decía yo sobre, sobre el compañero Lu que desgraciadamente se fue eh, eh, junto con Lu y otros compañeros y, y algunos campesinos estamos en este proyecto de la esta cooperativa de Cúrate se llama ahí estamos produciendo la moringa eh, es un proyecto muy interesante y, y es lento como muchos proyectos pero ahorita nosotros, nuestra meta es tratar de producir golosinas para los niños a base de esta planta y hemos hecho ya algunas pruebas, por ejemplo, con churritos, son los snacks que, que todo el mundo conoce, pero lo hacemos con, con un maíz que sabemos que los mismos compañeros de la cooperativa están produciendo, que es un maíz uf, de, de generaciones, y aparte con la moringa que sabemos cómo la estamos cultivando. Eh, también hemos ya hecho pruebas con, con unos dulces, aquí les decimos gomitas, y, y son, son productos que son, son, digamos, 
comida muy fácil que los niños siempre están pidiendo, ¿no? Que las papitas, los churros, los dulces. Pero yo en lo particular pienso mucho en estos niños, en las nuevas generaciones, ¿qué les va a tocar? En muchas cosas, el agua, la manera de, de, de vivir, eh, eh, la comida, en fin. Yo pienso que si, que si todos podemos contribuir con un poquito, va a cambiar. Vamos a cambiar, podemos cambiar muchas cosas, lo que podemos eh, hacer desde nuestra parte. En este proyecto de, de, de este cultivo, es muy importante para nosotros atender en un poquito esta situación con los niños en las escuelas. Eh, ahora nuestros, eh, eh, me tocaría decir nietos, eh, ¿qué les va a tocar vivir? Yo me he dado cuenta en las comunidades, por ejemplo, todos estos productos eh, de, del nopal, que son las tunas, garamullos, todo este tipo de frutos, los niños ya no quieren. O sea, ya no les gusta, o sea, yo me he dado cuenta en las familias, ¿no? No, yo no quiero, mejor yo quiero un, un chocorrol o un gancito, yo no sé. Pero yo me pregunto, ¿eso a quién le corresponde? Tiene mucho que ver con nosotros como padres o como abuelos, tratar de rescatar toda esta riqueza que ahí está, pero muchas veces queremos cerrar nuestros ojos y queremos como, como, como modernizarnos pero de verdad hay una gran riqueza en el campo, en todo el mundo. Entonces, todo se relaciona simplemente a la educación, al conocimiento, y estar nosotros bien conscientes, y es el rescate de eso que todavía está ahí, pero que nosotros no queremos o volteamos nuestra mirada a otros lugares. Hace aproximadamente 15 días en Dolores Hidalgo se realizó un evento que era, este, eso, bueno, era una muestra de comida de comida tradicional de una comunidad indígena. Este, y como, yo siento que tuvo mucho éxito, o sea, el evento se llevó a cabo en la comunidad y se puso una mesa gigante, o sea, una sola mesa de la de la y la gente llegaba, compraba con las señoras de la comunidad que la preparaba la comida y se sentaban a comer ahí en la mesa. Pero lo interesante es que las personas, fue mucha gente a, al evento y la, toda la gente estaba platicando sobre la comida, o sea, en, en el sentido de preguntar, por ejemplo, a unas personas, este, bueno, ¿por qué no hay carne? Que es, pues, estamos comiendo cosas preparadas con verduras, con granos, garbanzos, este, no palitos. Y ya este, pues otra persona comentaba, ¿no? Pues que antes no había esta industrialización de la carne, no, no había carne, en ese entonces la gente comía lo que nos echaban, lo que nos Entonces como que siento como que fue muy importante porque se hizo conciencia en lo que era la comida de antes, de los antepasados, la Y yo siento como que las personas se quedaron con, con, esa, con esa idea de, de regresar un poquito. O sea, de, de ver lo, lo que hemos hecho con toda esta industrialización, de que hemos cambiado totalmente nuestra forma de, de alimentarnos. Entonces creo que es importante como que se, se realicen este tipo de eventos, este, como que es una forma de, de seguir haciendo conciencia, porque yo siento que las personas que fueron se nos, nos cambian un poquito el, el chip. Entonces este, creo que es importante que se difunda, se, se promueva este tipo de eventos. And these events I always like the elephant in the room these days is um, climate change because I know a family that lives on a Hilo land and I've learned more from them than any book I've ever read. And about 30 or 40 years ago they had water running in the river all year round and now maybe it's uh, one or two weeks a year. And they depend on this water to water their corn and beans and squash and this I'm sure is playing out all over the world, the drought and the climate change. And I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but that's another factor. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate with the 
Is it Luke who is sitting there and busy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the time that he's taking to transcribe the logs of the local farmers is so valuable beyond the immediate uh, need for organic the, the peer review. It's preserving this tradition and it's preserving traditions will allow us to understand how to farm really dry areas. So for example, the Hopi in Southwest US will have amazing techniques for severely dry farming. And there's Miguel Santa Esteban, who is, is a farmer in house, and he's working so hard to reform these traditions because the elders are dying off now. And the, the young people see it's too hard to, <laughs> to farm, they're getting their they're moving. They're moving away from these traditions. But as we lose these traditions, we lose the wisdom of a particular place. And I really appreciate that aspect of this project because we need to share that information. We need to connect people from a slightly drier climate and say, well, this is how we do it, so that they can learn to adjust while maintaining the wisdom of health. Pues son las seis y parece que no nos queremos ir. ¿no? <risa> Agradecemos muchísimo a todos ustedes su participación y sé que hay mucho, mucho más que hablar. Eh, pues solo nos queda decir muchísimas gracias.